Live from CNN Center in Atlanta, this is Headline News. I'm Judy Fortin. It was meant to be an inner office memo. It's become the latest issue in the countdown to Election Day. A White House statement released today calls the memo from Budget Director Alice Rivlin a catalog of ideas. Today's Washington Post reports the ideas include limited tax deductions for mortgage interest and smaller increases in Social Security checks. White House aides say Rivlin's list is not a set of recommendations, but Republicans claim it is, and they say it shows presidential hypocrisy. The one talking point that the White House has been hammering on in the last couple of weeks is that the Republican contract with America would lead to Social Security cuts. I don't believe that's true, but that's what the president has been saying. Now it turns out the president has been hosting a discussion of a bunch of options which include large Social Security cuts. So I think it, it certainly takes the issue of social security cuts off the table for the White House. A new book purports to reveal some secrets about the Clinton administration. Elizabeth Drew writes the president almost changed his policy on Bosnia-Herzegovina twice last year. One time he was reportedly influenced by a history book he read on the Balkans. The book also claims Mr. Clinton thought about sending ground soldiers to Bosnia after watching CNN reports from Sarajevo. Mr. Clinton is stumping in Seattle. He's making several stops today with Ron Sims, who hopes to win the Senate seat now held by Republican Slade Gorton. Democrats currently have 56 Senate seats. Republicans are hoping to end Election Day as the Senate's majority party. I think they could have 51 or 52, and with a little luck, uh, there's still three or four uh, serious ch uh, challenges against some of the Democrats. Uh, uh, it could go even higher. I'm not going to sit here and say that we're not in for a tough year, but from, what, from my conversations around the country, and I talked to a lot of people this weekend before I came on the show, uh, there's, a, I'd say, people more optimistic uh, this weekend than they were last weekend in the Democratic Party, and I just hope that we're more optimistic next weekend than we were this weekend. Uh, I hope and I believe that we'll retain control of the United States Senate. President Clinton begins a trip to the Middle East Tuesday. U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Madeleine Albright says a planned meeting with Syria's president is necessary to push the peace process. Nationwide, gubernatorial races are indicating that Election Day could be a long day for the Democrats. Jed Duval reports. In many contests, the GOP's message is this one, as voiced by the Georgia Republican Guy Milner, who is trying to unseat Governor Zell Miller. I've got an incumbent uh, professional politician who is absolutely uh, determined not to give up that office because he, uh, he only knows professional politics. The notion that the businessman knows better is selling well in Texas, where George W. Bush, the former president's son, is using it against the incumbent, Ann Richards. They're running even. Mitt Romney had been doing well against Teddy Kennedy in the Senate race in Massachusetts, but Kennedy, spending heavily, has moved ahead in the most recent polling. Which side is getting its message through to voters generally? Ed Rollins, one of the leading message makers of the Republican Party, is optimistic. I think Republicans are going to take the Senate, and I think they'll win 25 to 30 House seats. And I think they're going to do very well among the governor's chips. There is a Clinton message. Inflation and unemployment staying low, the economy and output both expanding. A successful administration so far. That's what Democratic Party strategist James Carville would tell you. But he's worried that message is not getting through. So who's to blame? Frankly, and press has to share some of the blame for that. That aside, Carville sees a bright side. But I think that things are looking up a little bit. I think the president's numbers up a little bit. And I think people are starting to... And I think if we just stay focused and get out what's happening, we do a better job. If the polls are correct, Kathleen Brown is one who will have to do a better job, running for the governorship once held by her brother and her father. It's now held by Pete Wilson, and this weekend the contest is considered very close. Jed Duval for CNN, Washington. A little more than two weeks before presidential elections in Sri Lanka, an opposition candidate is dead. Gamini Disanayaki is among 50 people police say were killed in an explosion in the capital city, Colombo. The blast occurred shortly after Disanayaki wrapped up a speech at a campaign rally. Three other opposition party leaders also are reported dead. The cause of the blast has not been determined. Police are investigating. A television station in Alabama reports an escaped convict has has killed four people. WBRC says the escapee reportedly killed a prison official, the official's wife, and two other inmates at a state prison cattle ranch before setting one building on fire. The State Department of Corrections is only confirming one death. 
A TV station also quotes unidentified state troopers as saying the escapee has been caught. Texas workers are battling strong currents in the cleanup of more than a million gallons of crude oil and gasoline from the San Jacinto River. Burning oil has coated the flooded river since Thursday. Officials say that's when several fuel lines were ruptured by debris. Houston area businesses have lost an estimated million dollars a day in ship traffic. Still, a Coast Guard spokesman says cleanup workers have turned the corner. But I am able to report that we recovered some 3,000 barrels of oil water mixture yesterday, uh, most of that up on the San Jacinto River. River. So we have made some progress, and, uh, and I hope that we again have the benefits of a high evaporation rate because of the characteristics of this crude and that we've made substantial progress over the last 24 hours. No rain is expected through tomorrow in southeast Texas, but flooding from last week's downpour is still a threat. The Brazos River may not reach its high point near the Gulf Coast until Tuesday. A separate storm killed two people in north Texas. Heavy rains caused massive flooding in Dallas on Friday. Israel and the PLO have very different ideas on how to deal with Palestinian extremists. The two sides are meeting in Cairo today. Israeli Foreign Minister Shimon Peres says Israel wants the PLO to crush extremist groups like Hamas. Today, Israel gave its security forces authority to hunt down and arrest Hamas leaders. The PLO says the crackdown, including the Israeli closure of Gaza and the West Bank, undermines peace efforts. Israeli soldiers shot and killed a Palestinian in the West Bank town of Hebron today. The military says the man had stabbed and wounded a soldier at a checkpoint. A Honduran flag tanker suspected of carrying Iraqi fuel is in Kuwaiti waters today after being diverted by the U.S. Navy and Coast Guard. A Navy spokesman says there is substantial evidence pointing to a violation of U.N. sanctions. Kuwaiti officials say they'll take things from here. It is the second seizure of a suspicious Gulf tanker in 10 days. It may be early next year before the bulk of U.S. military personnel leave Haiti. United Nations Ambassador Madeleine Albright says the transition period will reduce the military total from 16,000 to 3,000. The special U.S. Justice Department unit will begin training new Haitian police tomorrow. A five-day cram course is designed to develop 3,000 interim officers by mid-December. Canadian officials are trying to douse the controversy surrounding a government agency that may have spied on fellow Canadians. Keith Boag has the story. This heavily guarded building in suburban Ottawa is the home of the Communications Security Establishment, or CSE, the Defense Department's spy service. There is almost no official information about how the CSE works, but over time various sources have confirmed that it's capable of monitoring most forms of communication in Canada and around the world. Its budget is not identified in public documents. Instead, it's buried somewhere inside the $350 million budget for overall defense communications. CSE is believed to be bigger, better equipped, and more intrusive than CSIS, the civilian spy service. Allegations that CSE has spied on politicians such as René Levesque and Jacques Parizeau had opposition members demanding an explanation earlier this week. But few answers are forthcoming. And after a weekend cabinet meeting today, the Minister for Defense refused to give any details about what the CSE does. The CSE does not target the communications of Canadians. We operate within the ambit of the law. And uh, that's all I'm prepared to say about uh, those intelligence matters. Well, quite frankly, that's not being accountable because there are, well, that's yeah, your, there are that's, facts being that's your, set out That's there. your opinion, and I'm sure that you will reflect that in your writing. Colinet would not explain why the CSE is not held publicly accountable in the same way that CSIS is. Uh, there are no um, accountability mechanisms uh, like the one CSIS has for CSE, and that is something that has been determined uh, by previous governments and previous parliaments, and we believe that the way it's structured right now is sufficient. The veil of secrecy behind which the CSE operates is about to be lifted. The Auditor General has decided to see whether Canadian taxpayers are getting their money's worth out of all of these spies. It's expected to complete its first ever value-for-money audit of the whole Canadian spy community within about a year. Keith Bogue, CBC News, Ottawa.
A woman who shot a doctor who performed abortions at a Kansas clinic may be charged for attacks at other clinics as well. Today's Portland Oregonian reports Rachel Shannon will be named in two federal indictments tomorrow. She's reportedly suspected in arson and acid attacks in California, Idaho, Nevada, and Oregon. Shannon's already serving 10 years in prison for shooting Dr. George Tiller in Wichita last year. Illinois State Police say the shooting of a Chicago judge last night may have been an accident. James Harvey was shot in the neck while standing outside his garage. He was originally listed in fair condition. Today, police say Harvey may have been hit by a bullet from a high-powered rifle fired by a man who was shooting into the air a mile away. A network spokesman reports former president of CBS News, Bill Leonard, has died. He died of a stroke today at a hospital near Washington. Leonard played a key role in creating the show 60 Minutes, and he selected Dan Rather to succeed Walter Cronkite as the anchor of CBS Evening News. Leonard was 78. A Navy missile test went awry early today off the coast of Florida. A missile fired from a Trident nuclear submarine lost power shortly into its flight and had to be blown up. All debris fell safely into the sea. The missile from the submarine Ohio was carrying a dummy warhead. Someone in a small British town finds church bells a less than joyful noise. Robert Hall reports that's causing a clash of ancient tradition and modern rules. Two. Trouble's going. Gone. The bells at Tunstall have been summoning their parishioners since the 13th century echoing across the surrounding countryside and rarely interrupted. So the Bell team were astounded to receive a visit from an environmental health inspector, summoned not by the Bells, but by a complaint that long practices made an intolerable racket. When you move into the country, particularly near a church, one would expect to find out whether there were church bells and when and if they ring. We've been ringing here since the 13th century, so we've been here for quite a long time now. So this was no different from the usual type of complaint of disco noise, factory noise. We have to respond to it. There'll be no witch hunts, but the complaint and the council's intervention have raised the temperature. I mean, I don't think the law was ever intended to apply to bell ringing. But as so often happens in these cases, it, it does. And if it does, then we have to abide by the law. And if there is a clampdown, they could always win on appeal. Robert Hall, ITN, Kent. Up next in Dollars and Cents, we'll have a look at what could be the farm of the future. And later, Prince Charles airs another load of dirty laundry. For a change, calm weather will be found over most of the U.S. There will be a few showers along the eastern seaboard and in the northern Midwest. This is Headline News, a CNN network. darkest corner and brings you a macabre movie experience who better to host such a fiendish night the master of devilish drama christopher lee peter Lorre and sydney greenstreet are very fine actors each in their own right but when they get together they are the finest after the tnt movie experience you'll agree with me they are a truly gruesome twosome. Our hero of horror will take you under his wing and into the night, drawing on his own experience and letting you in on the story behind two of his favorite Hollywood stars. So join me, Christopher Lee, for the TNT movie experience, Gruesome Twosome, on the 30th of October. If you've missed Larry lately, you've missed a lot. 
take it, Ron. What's going on out there? I can't explain it. What is it? It's you, buddy. Come on. No. I do like you. I like it. I'm crazy about Larry. Oh, this is a good job. Well, let's give him their money's worth. <laughs> to the vice president, Chevy Chase, Kathleen Turner. There are younger women out there. God bless them. It could be the president, famous folks, or even Larry's boss. You never know who's going to drop in. So check out Larry on CNN International. Farmers gathering in Georgia this weekend are harvesting information on how new technology can help them and the environment. Sean Caleb's reports. Acres of asphalt are fertile ground right now for many southeastern farmers. Moultrie, Georgia is the site of the annual Sunbelt Agricultural Expo. A chance for farmers to check out everything under the sun that helps them eke out a living. Like this $130,000 tractor. Fully loaded, of course. The air conditioning, stereo, radio, comfort seats, all the controls at your fingertips, tilt wheel. It's almost like being on a Cadillac. It's a show fit for queens and kings. But organizers say center stage is reserved for folks who work to feed a nation. As long as we want to eat, wear clothing, and live in houses, we need agriculture to be strong. More than 200,000 people are expected to pass through the gates in this small Georgia town during the three-day event. Most are farmers eyeing the latest in technological advances. But this year's show also features something new, an extensive exhibit on ways farmers can help preserve the environment. The focus is on reducing soil erosion safer ways to handle poisonous chemicals such as pesticides, but the most attention is on protecting groundwater quality. We want to break it to the farm as gently as they must do this, and they're coming around nicely. Much of the farmland in the southeast is sandy, porous soil. This exhibit shows how chemicals and fertilizer can seep into aquifers, polluting drinking water for a whole community. Livestock also creates environmental headaches. Right now, waste runoff is captured in lagoon ponds to keep it from washing into streams and rivers. But it can still seep into groundwater. Ponds. So farmers are being forced uh, to build new, modern storage ponds. They have some type of a liner underneath it, whether it's concrete, plastic, or clay. And uh, what this does is keep the nutrients from penetrating down into the aquifers. Sounds simple, but the initial cost for farmers is $110,000. In many ways, the face of farming remains unchanged. But in others, it's being altered dramatically. There's a fine line between profit and loss for growers. And they say if they don't remain on the cutting edge, the next harvest could be their last. Sean Caleb, CNN, Moultrie, Georgia. Between them, you'll find the biggest stars, hottest movies, and the latest in TV, music, and the stage. From Broadway to Hollywood, in front of the camera and behind the scenes, if entertainment's making news, Jim Murray and Lauren Sidney will tell you what's happening in Showbiz Today, live weeknights, only on CNN International. Monday. It's the mystery that has riveted a nation. Absolutely 100% not guilty. An American idol charged with a double murder faces life in prison. Now on the eve of the trial, CNN reviews the case from the crime scene to the freeway chase to the courtroom drama that has raised more questions than answers. The complete story of The Simpson Murder Mystery, CNN presents on CNN International. Around the world we take you, checking on the weather forecast. First, across the Pacific Rim, you're waking up to sunshine in Seoul and Tokyo and Beijing. We could see some showers, especially later on in the day, but uh, sunshine skies at least partially. 16 for the high temperature, a little bit milder as you go farther to the east. Hong Kong sunny, look west. 
and uh, pretty good weather in Bombay. Partly sunny but hazy skies up to 33. Here's the reason why, and we update you on the typhoons as well. High pressure for the most part keeping skies fairly clear. Pretty good clear sky across a good bit of India into Southeast Asia, some rain showers. And then in the South China Sea, we turn our attention to Teresa. Wind speed's likely up to about 65 knots in this time frame. We'll watch it move somewhat uh, westerly, keeping a close watch on that. Of course, it interacting with land will cause some problems. Vern at the same time, up to about 90 to 95 knots. And moving somewhat north and westerly, we'll have to watch it closely both for uh, the Philippines' sake and for Taiwan's sake. And Wilda up to about 90 knots. And uh, it's westerly movement, uh, not at a real good clip, but somewhat westerly movement. To the north, you can see clear sky across North and South Korea and Japan. South now to Australia, New Zealand too. Uh, pretty good weather, but some showers scattered about. Port Moresby rain is expected there. In Auckland, some rain showers. The South Island, a little bit better weather overall with this front not causing too much more than some cloudiness. In the Bight region, uh, on into the south and the east, breezy conditions with the front that uh, stretches itself across the western sections, both onshore flow and the trough in the north and the east, keeping some rain in the forecast. Rain is beginning to exit to the right uh, off the east coast of the United States. Rain and snow across the Great Lakes region of the U.S. and Canada, towards James Bay, some snow there too. And in south Texas, where there's been so much flooding, we could see some rain, but likely not real heavy. To the south, in South America, scattered storms, southern Argentina and Chile. Uruguay seeing some rain. Across Brazil, a little bit of rain, too. That's a look at international weather. Andre Agassi beat Michael Stieck to win the U.S. Open last month. Well, on Sunday, Stieck had a shot at revenge as they met in the finals of the CA Trophy in Vienna. So let's take you there. This is Agassi in the near court, and once again, he was too strong for Stieg. Andre with a cross-court winner. He goes on to victory in four sets. Agassi has never lost to Stieg, 6-0 a lifetime. To Leon, where Mark Rosset upset Jim Courier to take the title. Courier hasn't won a tournament in 14 months. To Beijing, where Michael Chang won the Salem Open by beating Anders Jarrett. To Hong Kong, where Stefan Edberg beat Richard Krychek to win the Marlboro Exhibition. And to Brighton, England, where Yana Novotna in the near court won the indoor there for the second straight year. Novotna beat Helena Sokova in three sets. The Japan World Series is all squared a game apiece as they head to Cebu Stadium for game three on Tuesday. On Sunday at the Tokyo Dome, it was a pitcher's duel with the Yamayuri Giants beating the Cebu Lions 1-0. Hiromi Makahari threw a four-hitter. Dan Gladden scored the only run of the game. The Giants had just two hits, but that was enough. On to cricket, the three-nation limited overs series between India, the West Indies, and New Zealand got underway on Sunday, and the opener saw India beat the West Indies by four wickets. Skipper Mohammad Azarudin cracked 81 off 84 balls. And the fourth day of the second test between Zimbabwe and Sri Lanka, all Zimbabwe as Sri Lanka follows on, hoping for a draw. To golf, it rained again at the Czech Open, but here's the good news. They did get in 18 holes on Sunday, and Sweden's Per Ulrich Johansson took advantage, fired a five under par 66 to win by three over countryman Klaus Eriksson. Nobody challenged. And the U.S. won eight of ten singles matches on Sunday to take the Solheim Cup away from Europe. Week 8 of the NFL season and the Cleveland Browns showing no signs of slowing up. The Browns ran their record to 6-1 with a 30-13 win over the Cincinnati Bengals. And once again, it was Eric Metcalf. Once he picked up the ball, he was gone. 73 yards on the punt return for the score. Browns with the second best record in the NFL off to their best start since 1963, the days of Jim Brown. Scoreboard, the Steelers handed the Giants their fourth straight loss. Lions beat the Bears. The Saints held off the Rams. There's the Browns win. Washington outscored Indianapolis. And Joe Montana and the Chiefs beat Seattle. And that's a look at sports. Brightly lit floats sailed the Mekong River as Thailand celebrated the end of the Buddhist Lent. The festivities included dancers, drummers, and fireworks, all designed to lure Buddha back to Earth for a day. The Buddhist Lent lasts three months, during which monks stay inside monasteries to meditate. 
A French woman has what officials call an unprecedented lead after the first leg of the BOC round the world yacht race. Isabelle Otissier arrived in Cape Town, South Africa early this morning, two hours ahead of her closest rival. The one-person boat left Charleston, South Carolina 35 days ago. Otissier could become the first woman to win a major long-distance yacht race. Wheelchair winner Ken Archer led the field at today's Marine Corps Marathon in Washington and Arlington, Virginia. He said the rain-soaked course slowed him down. A Mexican Army sergeant won the regular men's division. A Virginia mother of two children was the top woman. Also among the 16,000 runners, talk show host Oprah Winfrey. We're not gonna lose, not gonna do it. Not gonna, not gonna. Not Dana, George Bush here. I'm watching you do your impression of me, and I gotta say, it's nothing like it. Will the real George Bush please stand up? The former president got the last laugh on Saturday Night Live last night. He opened the show from Houston and joined guest host and former cast member Dana Carvey in the opening monologue. Carvey is known for his Bush impression. Bush vowed to get even for the jokes made at his expense, but he said, quote, it wouldn't be prudent at this juncture. New excerpts from the authorized biography of Britain's Prince Charles are giving British newspapers plenty of fresh gossip. Vicki Barker reports on the latest headlines. According to his authorized biography, Prince Charles has had not one, but three affairs with his close friend, Camilla Parker Bowles, beginning in the early 1970s when he was a young Navy officer and continuing with a five-year interruption after his engagement to the then Lady Diana Spencer. This follows last week's disclosure that Charles never loved the woman he took as his bride. Predictably, Britain's newspapers are shocked. Shocked! So shocked, they're devoting hundreds of column inches to the story. But by making his private letters and journals available to his biographer, Jonathan Dimbleby, Prince Charles is clearly gambling that the British public will see things his way once they hear his side of the story. What the Prince of Wales is hoping for is for everybody to read this massive tome from Dimbleby, which is 600 pages long, if any of us can bear it, so that we get a balanced picture. Princess Diana has appeared publicly unruffled on a private visit to the United States. But with these new revelations, the public relations battle between Charles and Diana is going thermonuclear. His authorized biography paints him as a sensitive husband and father who desperately tried to do his duty to an emotionally unstable wife and who fully intends to take the throne. Her biography paints him as distant and obsessed with Camilla Parker Bowles. So far, neither party seems close to declaring victory or admitting defeat. The question is, how much dirty laundry can be aired in public before the public decides that royal dirty laundry looks just like everybody else's? Vicki Barker, CNN, London. Coming up at the top of the hour on Headline News, on the campaign trail, President Clinton takes aim at Republicans and they fire back. A surprising report on the state of the nation's health care and portraits of despair and survival by battered women. Those stories and Bob Lozier in two minutes. I'm Judy Fortin, a whole day's news every half hour. This is Headline News. This is Headline News, a CNN network.